chapter number one, if you will, this morning. We're going to, uh, we've been looking, it's Christmas time and everybody's in that uh, season of thinking and so forth. So I thought I would take last week, this week, and we're going to do one more next week, uh, talking about the women uh, in the Lord's genealogy here. And uh, in Matthew 1, there's actually five ladies listed. And we looked at the first four ladies. Ne- by the way, next week, we'll be, I know Christmas is on Friday. We're going to look at the, the women who saved Christmas. There's a group of daughters that saved Christmas and uh, what we call is Christmas. But uh, we, we looked here last week, the, these women listed. And this morning, we're going to look at Mary. And uh, we looked at Tamar there and uh, where she represents and shows the issue of God forgiving the sinner. The, the issue here, again, these ladies are in the Lord's genealogy because of verse 1. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of, of Abraham. And that fact that when Jesus Christ was born, he was born of Mary, a virgin birth. And then he lives his life and he goes and dies at Calvary for uh, and so forth, and does out his earthly ministry, he's doing it for the nation of Israel. That's uh, Paul over there uh, in Romans 9 says, hey, he came for them. He didn't come for you and I. He came for the nation of Israel. Now, under the change in the program and under the issues of the dispensation of grace, Paul says, yeah, but he also came for you and I, and here's that information. But here in Matthew, so we're, we're talking about Israel, and she, these ladies are going to remind Israel about something about the Messiah, their Messiah, the Lord. And what Tamar does is she, she goes in and she pulls a little slippy doo hoop de doo with Judah and uh, has a couple, uh, has an illicit affair with him and... Uh, plays the role of a of of a of a of a whore there the verses say in Genesis 38 and she commits a sin a great sin but yet she is going to remind Israel that God forgives the sinner and and that's what he's going to do when he you're in Matthew 1 if you look down there at verse 21 he says, and she shall bring forth the son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. That's what he's going to do. So then when you have Tamar, the two boys there in verse 3, and, and then you have Rahab there in, in verse 5, and Rahab is going to look, she's a Gentile, she's not a Jew, but she's a Gentile, and, and there you have her reminding Israel that God accepts the believer. And, and honestly, with, with God all through Scripture, no matter where you read, no matter where you study, God is looking for a heart of faith. He constantly is looking for that. No matter who it is, if if they have faith, then God is going to accept the believer. And Rahab, you remember her, the two spies come and she hides them. She's no longer Rahab the harlot, even though that is her moniker. She's now Rahab and she looks at those two guys and says, Listen, I've heard about your God. We believe your God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we heard what he did with you guys out of Exodus. And we know the Abrahamic covenant. And I'm going to bless you and you're going to bless me. And, he, and she does it. And when Joshua and the guys come into Jericho and tear the city down, the only left standing house in all of Jericho was her house. And they go and uh, they take care of... Rahab and all those in her house. By the way, you remember in Tamar, the babies are the twins boys are coming out, and the first one sticks his arm out and they tie that scarlet string around him. And then he ends up coming out second, and the other boy's born first. And then in Rahab, they're to lay out a scarlet thread, a rope out that window. And then you have Ruth. Again, Ruth is a Gentile, she's a Moabitess. Deuteronomy 32, the law forbid a Moabitess to ever enter the congregation of Israel. And yet she goes and attaches herself to Naomi. And then goes in and does the kinsman redeemer uh, issues and so forth with Boaz. And becomes Boaz's uh, uh, wife. And, and, and they beget Obed of Ruth. And Obed beget Jesse. I'm in Matthew 1 verse 5. And Jesse beget David the king. So you have this direct line. And what Ruth shows is, hey, God is going to deliver Israel from the law. From that, that mechanism that's designed to control themselves. And then you have David. 
And with David, verse 6, David begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias, and that's Bathsheba. And with Bathsheba, David goes and does, and he says, we looked at the Psalms last time, he says, against thee and thee only have I sinned. He recognized immediately what he had done. He went to Nathan, and Nathan came to him, and I showed you there in the Psalms that David never offered a sacrifice. That's not what God wanted from David. God wanted his contrite heart. He wanted to know that David had that heart of faith. So what you see in, in Bathsheba with Israel is God is going to secure the sinning saint. He's going to take that believer and, and there's security there. That's why Paul in Romans 4 will look at David and quote David out of there out of Psalms and say, Blessed is the man into whom the Lord will not impute sin. David should have been murdered, should have been killed twice. He committed adultery, and then he committed murder. But because of his heart and who he was, as a believer, God forgave him. David never understood that. None of Israel ever understood how God could deliver David and forgive him until you come to the Apostle Paul. And Paul says, you know how he did it was by grace. And he laid out Paul. Now you're going to come to Mary, verse 16. I just want to look at Mary this morning. She's very popular. Whole religions born and, and dressed up around her. Verse 16, uh, Matthew 1, verse 16, And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. And what Mary's going to do here is Mary is going to show Israel that little flock, that believing remnant. That's what she's going to picture as that issue of being a willing vessel to be used for his glory. We're going to go over to Luke here in a minute, and we'll see her talk about being the handmaiden. But Matthew 1 here, you've got Mary. She's going to, she's, she's the, has Joseph. The, notice, notice verse 16 very carefully. And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. The, the issue when he says there of whom was born, if you go back up to verse 2, Abraham what? Begat Isaac. Do you see that word begat? That word begat runs all the way down to verse 16, and at verse 16 it changes to of whom was born. A protection of the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because Abraham begat Isaac. How did Isaac get life? Because of Abraham, his dad, right? How did the Lord Jesus Christ come to be born of Mary? It wasn't because of Joseph, but it was because of what we're going to read here down in verse 18, 19, and 20 when Gabriel comes to Joseph and explains to Joseph why Mary is now pregnant, having come over to Luke 1, having not been with anybody... <laughs> She's a virgin, and all of a sudden now she's pregnant. How did that happen? You know, you think about Joseph. He, he's, this is his fiance Mary, they, you know, and now she's come up pregnant. What, what kind of scandal is this? By the way, the religious leaders of Israel later in the Lord's life uses it as scandalous, as we know who you are. You're one born over there out of iniquity and adultery, and ooh, shame, shame. And they, didn't, they had no clue about what they were talking about. You come to Luke 1. You see, Joseph there in Matthew 1 is going to, the angel Gabriel is going to come and explain to her, to Joseph, what has happened to Mary, why she's this way. But I, I just want to look here at Mary. Because as we begin to talk about and to think about Mary, what begins to happen is she t gets placed in religion out there, in a very special place, a whole group, a whole church, a whole system is around worshiping her. And in reality, when you listen to what she says, that is the complete opposite of what has happened is what she had in mind. If you look there at Luke 1, and if you look at verse forty. Well, look at verse 26, just real quick here. And in the sixth month, the angel 
Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying. You know, if an angel showed up, you'd be a little troubled too. You know, they, they, <laughs> that's, a, that's a shocking development there. And he says, and she's and cast in her mind, verse 29, what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And that's critical. That's important to notice. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the king, the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. How's she going to get pregnant? Who's coming upon her? Not Joseph, but who? The Holy Ghost. So the father of the son is not Joseph. All of the new Bibles, all of them, change and make Joseph the Lord's father. And they change verses and they manipulate that to attack the virgin birth. Because in order for the Lord Jesus Christ, to be our Savior, He has to have been of no sin. He has to. He has to be perfect. Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, He that knew no sin. <laughs> he didn't know sin. He didn't have a sin. He, had, he didn't have that sin nature passed to him by Joseph. So you have the Holy Ghost is the Father. Is the, is the initiator here. Verse 35, "...shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee be call, shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who is called barren." For with God nothing shall be impossible. Now watch Mary. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from me. See that issue about being a handmaiden and being a vessel? That's what Mary's going to demonstrate to the nation of Israel. And she's going to have an attitude of a handmaid. Now come over to verse 46. Because what happens, you, you guys know the song, Mary, Did You Know? Okay? She knew. All right? She, had, she, didn't have a, she didn't bat an eye. She had no doubt. Look at that verse 38 there. Behold the handmaid of the Lord. She's going to quote Psalms 116, verse 6. How does she quote that? She knows Psalms 116. She understands where they're at. She knows. Come, come over to Galatians 4, just real quick. Boy, there's so much here. There's just so much to put together. Galatians chapter 4 and verse number 4. Galatians 4, verse number 4. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law. You see that issue about being made of a woman? Go back to Luke 1. There's where we're at. Matthew 1, Luke 1. There's a time schedule back in the Old Testament, and it begins to start, and it's going to run out there, and Daniel chapter 9 gives the details. There's 69 weeks of this, weeks of years, and it's going to run out, and on the 69th week, so 483 years, Calvary is going to happen. Christ is going to be crucified. The Messiah is going to die for the sins of His people. Well, how old is He when He dies? He's 33, the age of the priest. So he fulfills the priest office. So they knew 483 years. We're going to back that up 33 years that he's born right there. By the way, he is not born in December. The passage we just looked at there where it talks about Elizabeth being six months along and so forth, that the conception is what happened in late December, not his birth. But see, religion hides that because what do they want you to focus on? His birth, not the real miracle, which is conception. Because what kind of conception was it? 
virgin birth. No man was involved. Just a vessel to be used, a handmaiden. So she knew, they understood, the time is near for the Messiah to be born. Go back to Luke. You've got to see this, kind of put this together. By the way, look at Luke 2. Luke 2. I'm off my, your handout, I apologize, but we'll get there. Luke 2, look at verse uh, 21. After the birth, verse 16, and there came... Uh, they came with haste and found Mary, talking about the shepherds, Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger, verse 21. Uh, and when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of this child, the, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. So eight days, where do they go? They go up to the temple. He's circumcised, verse 25. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, watch, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him, and it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Here's a guy, he knows the timing, and yet what is he waiting for? The birth of the Messiah. So guess what the Holy Ghost says? Go to the temple. There he is. And off he goes. He goes in, and you know what he does? He says, down there, he says, hey, here, here he is, verse 30. For my eyes have seen thy salvation. There he is, verse 36. And there was one, Anna. And you know what Anna's waiting for? The salvation and the consolation of Israel. And there he is. People, my point is, is there are people looking for the birth of Christ. Mary was too. Mary understood this. Come back to Luke 1, verse 46. And Mary is going to get a proclamation here of her own words, of what she says, what's going on in her own heart. Real quick, look at chapter 2 again. Look at verse 19. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Do you know why you're not going to read some of this in Matthew? She didn't tell Matthew. You know who she told some of the stuff we're going to read in Luke 1? She told her doctor, Dr. Luke. Ladies tell things to their doctors that they don't tell other people. And Dr. Luke here, he sits and he's beginning to, he's interviewing Mary. And his bedside manner is such that Mary just opens up to him. And in Luke 1, that's what you're reading. You're reading the things that Mary pondered in her heart. Verse 46, and Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord. Notice who's important to her when we read this. It isn't herself. It's who? The Lord. Verse 47, And my spirit hath rejoiced in God. Now this is critical. My Savior. There's an idea that Mary is sinless. Wait a minute. She thinks she is the sinner. Because what does she need? A Savior. There's an idea that Mary only had the Lord and then never had any other children. You go to Mark. He had at least seven. Mary had at least seven kids. The Lord and then some stepchildren. And they go through that and they list them out for you. And you, go, and you see, but what does Mary say herself? Forget about religion. Forget about the theologians and the wannabes. What does Mary say? What does she say? I magnify my Lord and my Savior. She comes along, and she's totally dedicated. She's completely devoted to the Lord, my Savior. Come over to chapter 10 of Luke. Luke chapter 10. You have to catch this. Luke 10. You start there in verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do in, to inherit eternal life? And he said on... Well, that's not right. No, go, never mind. Go back to chapter 1. Ah, bad note. My bad. Chapter 1. Mary... Oh, I know what it was in 10. <laughs> there you go. Look at verse 27. 
It wasn't a bad note. It's just Rick not remembering. <laughs> so bad up here. Look at verse 27. So the, 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 the lawyer says, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, what is written in the law? How readest thou? And he, and he answered saying, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as... You see how he says that about loving the Lord thy God? With all heart, soul, strength, and mind. That's how Mary loved the Lord. She loved him that way. She understands, come back to chapter 1. She understands that she's a part of the believing remnant in Israel. She understands where she is and who she is. Come back to 147, 46, 47. She understands that she's going to be living, if you look back there at chapter five, at verse number uh, 6, and they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord. How? Blameless. Doesn't say faultless. Faultless would mean that she's sinless. This is talking about Elizabeth and them there, but blameless. She understood who she was. She understood that she was a sinner. She understood that she was a part of the believing remnant. She understood that she could give her soul, whole self. She knows who's coming. She's well aware of it. So she says in verse 47, And my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. By the way, over in John chapter 2, the marriage at Cana, there, the servants are the, the servants, the apostles are working, and they come to Mary and say, What do we do? And you know what she says in John 2? Whatever he tells you to do, go do that. Not what I tell you to do, you do what he says. Who's the he? The Lord. She understood exactly who she was, where she was, and what she was going to be used as. Verse 48. Notice what she says again here. For he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. Are they, at a, are they right in calling her blessed? Yeah, because she is the mother of who? Of the Savior. But notice how she says low estate of thy handmaiden. Not high exalted, but low estate. She has a heart of humility here. And she begins to to think about and to talk about, and she's going to identify herself with what's going on. Come with me to Malachi. We're going to run back and forth in the Old Testament. You might as well stick something in the book of Psalms. Malachi chapter 3. Here's where we're at. We're, again, short time, a lot of stuff to cover, but I just want you to see it. Malachi 3, verse 8. Malachi 3, 8. Will a man rob God? Ye have robbed me, but ye, ha but ye say, Wherein hath we robbed thee? And tithes and offerings. So you better fill that offering box up back there, right? Okay. Who are we talking to? Israel, the nation of Israel, right? Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye, that's the nation, all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house, and prove me now herewith saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the, heaven, the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke and devour for your sake, and ye shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. All, and, now watch, and all nations shall call you, who? Israel, what? Blessed. You see, Mary is going to be used as a type, as a picture of Israel. She says, hey, look, I'm the handmaiden. And guess what? Everybody's going to call me what? Blessed. And she begins to use that, become that picture of Israel and the woman. So when you read through the old, uh, um, when you begin to read through, come to Psalms 116. When you begin to read through the, the Gospels, the Lord He's up on the cross, Psalms 116. He looks down at John and says, John, behold your mother. Woman, behold your son. 
And people go, what does that mean? So they skip it. They don't even think about it. Who's the woman? He's looking at Mary. Israel, type of Israel. John, a type of the little flock. And he says, little flock, take care of Israel. And Israel, you're going to get your blessing and protection from the little flock. So take care of them. <laughs> he's laying it because he's dying. He's on his way to glory. And he lays that in. And he uses Mary as that illustration. Look at Psalms 116, verse 16. She quotes this. O Lord, truly, I am thy servant. I am thy servant and the son, look at that, of thine handmaid. Thou hast loosed my bonds. If you go back up there, by the way, verse 1, I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplications, because he hath uh, inclined his ear. Verse 4, then call I upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee. Great, verse 5, gracious is the Lord. Verse 6, the Lord preserveth the simple. He, that's, the, that's the Messiah talking to the Father in the Garden of Gethsemane on the way to the cross. Verse 10, I believe, therefore have I spoken. I was greatly afflicted. And then what does he say in verse 16? I'm the son of thine handmaid. And in Luke 1, we read it a minute ago, what does Mary say? I'm thy handmaid. Come back to Luke 1. Mary, folks, she understood who she was. She understood that she was going to be the mother of the Messiah. She was going to be the mother of of the seed line. She was going to be the vehicle in which the Messiah was going to be born. She understood that. And you know what she did? Rather than load it over everybody, she comes in in a low estate, a lowliness, a humility. Back in chapter 1, verse 49, she makes the statement, For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is His name. Mary is going to now spend the rest of the time exalting her Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Holy is His name. You still you got Psalms, I hope. Psalms 111. You need really... <laughs> we're going to... This is what is on her mind. This is what she's thinking about. This is where her... Could you imagine? She's just like you and I, human as human can be. And, a, and Gabriel shows up. Not any angel, but Gabriel, head guy. And he goes, boo. <laughs> you know, off you go. No, he says, listen, this is what's going to happen. This is the word from the Father. This is what's going to happen. And she says, yeah, okay. Then it happens. She's going to get ready here in Luke to have the baby. And rather she sits there and she doesn't say, that's right, Elizabeth, you need to bow down and kiss my ring. She comes in with a, hey, I am nobody but a handmaid. I am nobody but the vessel. Matthew 1 or I'm sorry, Luke. You, you need Psalms 111. Matthew 1, or Luke 1 there, we, we read a minute ago, she, the angel said, For thou hast found favor with God. How do you find favor with God? You have a heart of, a, you have a heart of faith. You're believing the Word of God to you. She's believing it to her. She's got Psalms 111, verse number 1. Praise ye the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright, and in the congregation, and the works of the Lord are great, sought out of all of them that hath pleasure therein. Verse 9, He sent redemption unto His people. He hath commanded His covenant forever. Holy and reverent is His name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and a good understanding have all they that do His commandments. His praise endureth forever." That's what's on her mind when in Luke 1, 49, she says, holy is his name. He's the issue, not me. He's the issue. Back to Luke 1. Hold on to Psalms. You need 103. 
verse 50. She says, and his mercy is on them that fear him from this generation, from generation to generation, sorry. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. Psalms 103, 103, verse 17. Mary is just quoting what she knows. Psalms 103, verse 17. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. Upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto children's children. That's what's on her mind. Hey, you know what? His mercy. His mercy is on the, that believing remnant. Them that fear him. You, you read in Proverbs, you read later in Psalms about how you fear him. You know how you fear him? You fear him through his word through his commandments. She's just following right along with what she knows. Luke 1, verse 51, He hath showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. The imagination of their heart. His arm... He has showed strength with his arm. You're in Psalms. Look at Psalms 89. Psalms 89. It's fascinating how what she knows, what she's doing. Again, Elizabeth understands who she is and raises an exaltation and says, Man, blessed are you. And she says, Yeah, okay, but this is who's inside me. And he's the issue. Not me. He is. Psalms 89, look at verse 10 about his arm. Talking about his arm. Thou hast broken Rahab in pieces as one that is slain. Thou hast scattered thine enemies with thy, what? Strong arm. When he talks there, when she says that, hey, he has showed strength with his arm, boy, what's he going to do? He's going to come back and wage war. He's got a strong arm. Verse 13, thou hast a mighty arm. Strong is thy hand and high is thy right hand. She goes, man, he's got a purpose and a plan. Come back to Exodus 15. And that purpose and that plan is going to be laid out and he's the one that's going to do it. This little baby boy. That's going to be born here in a few months. Exodus 15. That issue again there. He has showed strength. He has scattered the proud, the imagination of their hearts. Exodus 15. If you look at verse 1, Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. They just, they just crossed the Red Sea. And he, Moses looks over there to him, and, and, and back up in verse 14, and he says, Israel, look and see your salvation. There it is, as the, as the waters come in and Pharaoh is taken out and so forth. And now they're going to sing a new song. They're going to get on the other side now, and they're going to see a song. And, and what they're going to do now is he's, Moses and the children are going to rehearse what has just happened. And they're going to sing their understanding of it. Verse 6. Thy right hand, O Lord, is become glorious in power. Wait a minute. Where was the strength we just read in Psalms? The right hand, that mighty arm. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. Notice what that right arm did. He, that right hand came out, and, he, and it's what? It's a judgment. He, he took care of business, did what the plan was. Verse 9. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. Verse 10, thou didst blow with thy wind. Verse 12, thou stretchest out thy right hand and the earth swallow them up. You know what the enemy said? Verse 9, I will. In Luke 1, she says, the imagination of their hearts. The imagination of the hearts of men says what? I will. I will do this. 
I will be my own God. And you know what Mary says? This baby, he is God. And you know what he's going to do to the haughtiness of man? Is he's going to bring them low. Isaiah. He's going to go back to Luke 1. Get Psalms again. Keep Psalms. Mary comes along and she says, you know what? Look at what he's going to do. He's going to bring down judgment. He's going to avenge. He's going to be the deliverer. The Lord's got a five mandated clause in the book of Psalms. There are five books within Psalms. He's the redeemer. He's the deliverer. He's the avenger. He's the blesser and he's the king. And he comes in and she says, you know what he's going to do? He's going to come in there and he's just going to take care of the enemy. And this baby that's, well, not in my belly, but growing here to be born of the low handmaiden is going to be the one that's going to carry it out. You know what that means? She understands the program that she's involved in and what's going to happen. Luke 1, verse 52 He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them, notice, of low degree. You know what Mary's saying there? She says only God can do that. Nobody else can do that. Come back to Psalms 107. Here's the passage. Psalms 107. You see, Mary knows that God will win the victory. He will win the battle against the adversary. And he's going to be Israel's redeemer, deliverer, avenger, king, blesser. Psalms 107, verse 40. He poureth contempt upon princes and causes them to wander in the wilderness where there is no way. Yet, watch, setteth he the poor on high from affliction and maketh him families like a flock. There it is. What's he going to do, verse 52? He's going to take the mighty, he's going to pull it down, and he's going to promote the lowest state. And that's what he does. Blessed are the meek, for they shall what? You know the beatitude. They're going to inherit the what? The earth. By the way, that's not you and I. (laughs) We inherit the heavenly places. Okay? That's Israel. That's where she's at. Go back to Luke 1. Hold on to Psalms, but go back there to Luke 1. By the way, in Luke 1, look over at verse 7. Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, he makes the same proclamation as Mary does. 170, verse 70. And he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which he hath been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. How are they saved from their enemies and all that hate them? What does he do? He comes back with that right, that mighty arm, that right hand, that strong, that strength, and he takes the halt, the high, and he puts them in their place, and he raises the low estate. Verse 53. I I hope you see what's going on. Mary's not a... Mary's not just some little girl sitting over here in the corner going, (laughs) it's a beautiful day outside, isn't it? No, she's a Bible student. She understands what's going on. She understood the timeline. She understands the program of God. And she understands that there's a seed line coming to be born of the house of David, which, by the way, she's a member of, and she knows that. Verse 53 He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent empty away. Psalms 107 again, 107. Here it is, verse 8. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men, for he satisfy the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul with goodness. There it is. That's what, he, she's, that's what he's going to do. Then he, she says, verse 54, He hath hope in his servant, Israel, in remembrance of his mercy. Now she's going to talk about the nation. Come back to Psalms 8, uh, 98. 
Psalms 98. She's been talking about the Lord and this baby that's to be born. Now she's talking about the nation. He's going to hope in his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. That's a, uh, Psalms 98 and verse 3. He hath remembered his mercy and his truth towards the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth hath seen the salvation of our God. What's he going to do one day? He's going to take care of his people out there in the future. Come back there to chapter 1 of Luke. She, folks, she understands what's going on. She's not just some little lowly handmaiden sitting over there in tattered clothes and is meek and mild and doesn't have a, a thought go on between her head. And at the same time, she's not some angelic, no non-sinner sitting over here just with radiant beaming out of her either. She's a faithful handmaiden sitting where she's supposed to be sitting, found favor in the eyes of God, understands what's going on, understands the program, understands where she's at, understands what's going on with her. When Gabriel shows up, she's taken aback just for the moment. He gives her the word. She doesn't argue with him. <laughs> she believes him and says, I'm, I'm the handmaiden. I'll be the vessel. In verse 55, and he spake to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed, for what? Forever. You see, she understands about the seed line. Come back to Psalms 105. She understands that she's in the seed line. The seed of the woman, back there with Eve, comes down through and becomes the seed of Abraham. And that seed line works through Isaac, not Ishmael. Then it works over through Jacob, not Esau. And it begins to come across there. That scarlet line begins to work through. And it comes down into David, the king, the great king of, of Jerusalem, the, the, the king after God's own heart. And David is the one. And now we're going to... Drift down through, and she understands that she's in that line. Look at Psalms 105. Look at verse 8. He hath remembered his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations, which covenant he made with Abraham and his oath unto Isaac, and confirmed the same unto Jacob for a law, and to Israel for an everlasting covenant, saying, Unto thee will I give the land of Canaan the lot of your inheritance. Israel's seed line is there. Come back to Luke 1. And it runs down. And it begins to go down. Now when you come to Jacob, Jacob had 12 boys. Jacob's name changes to Israel. So you got 12 tribes. You got the 12 boys. But that's a lot. So then they come down and they identify specifically which tribe the tribe of Judah. But Judah is the largest tribe of the nation. And then out of the tribe of Judah, they says, okay, there's one guy, Jesse, David's daddy. But that came through who? Come back there to Matthew 1. You need Luke 1, but go back to Matthew 1. But see, David, verse 6, and Jesse begat David, but who begat Jesse? Obed. Who had Obed? Boaz and Ruth, who had Boaz, Rahab, Tamar. See, you got all these ladies in the line, in the genealogy, running through. And Bathsheba has Solomon. Are you in Luke 1? I'm sorry, Matthew 1? Look, look down there at verse 12. This is so fascinating. Mary understood who she was. And who was coming in the baby she was carrying? She had no doubt about it. Here's the Savior. Here's my Messiah. I'm a sinner. I'm no good. I'm a low estate. He's the one. He's the Savior. He's the Messiah. He's the one we're going to exalt and proclaim. I'm just the vessel. I'm just the picture of Israel and that seed line. Something happens, though, in verse 12. Matthew 1, 12. 
And after they were brought to Babylon, you see Jeconias begat, say, that guy. <laughs> and then all those guys get down there, verse 16. And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary. You see Jeconias there in verse 12. You go back to Jeremiah 22, you go back to 1 Chronicles 3, and that man was cursed that none of his inheritors, his descendants, would ever sit on the throne of Israel. But wait a minute, there he is in Joseph. That's bad news, isn't it? But wait a minute, now come to Luke chapter 3. And in Luke 3, you see Mary's genealogy. Okay, it starts in verse 23, and it runs all the way down to verse 38, goes all the way back to Adam. <laughs> it's amazing. But look, if you will, at verse 31. Mary is of the house of David as well, which is the son, you see 31, see the end of that verse, which was the son of Nathan, which was the son of who? David. Now let's think about this. Here's Mary. She knows what's going on. She knows what's happening. She's clued into it. And she knows that Joseph can't be daddy because his line has been cursed. But Mary can be the vessel because the line goes through Nathan, not Jeconias. Joseph could have never been the Savior's father because the Savior was destined to sit on the throne as Israel's king. But what did the curse say, Jeremiah? You can't sit there. Mary says, he's not the daddy of the, of the Lord, but I can, he can sit on the throne because he's my son. He was born of me. Do you follow that? Now, you get into religion and they don't catch that. Because what do they make? They make Joseph his dad. But he can't. He's the king. There's no way to do that. Go back to Luke 1. <clears throat> Luke 1. I have to find this verse. Luke 1. Verse 56. And Mary abode with her about three months and returned to her own house. Now Elizabeth full time came that she would be delivered, and she brought forth a son, and, and John the Baptist is born. Next week, first hour, we're going to run through the dating through Luke 1 and get the dating down. Okay? We haven't done it in a while. But you take Luke chapter number 1 and you lay out John the Baptist, and you know what you quickly understand? That late December, the miracle is not the birth. When, when Mary has the baby in chapter 2 in Bethlehem, and they're stuck down in uh, the manger, in, in, in that that is a normal birth. Wrapping him in swaddling clothes, you know they do that today. The ladies that have had just had babies, what are they? they wrap that sucker up, <laughs> make him look like a, a cigar, you know, the, you know. Why? Because that's, that's been found to do. They've been doing that all along. The birth part is no different. But you know, the Lord's ch childhood, everybody wants to know what the Lord did. Ch he did the same thing your children have done, you did, just without sin. Because he doesn't have a sin nature. Because Joseph isn't his dad. You follow that? Okay. It's critical. By the way, the wise men were not at the manger scene. They come later, Matthew says, where it's a young child in a house. There's more than three wise men. There's a group of them. They bring the three, gold, the three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. People think that that's why there's only three. No, when you understand the Magi and who they were in history, they traveled in groups of anywhere from 25 to 50 for safety reasons. They didn't have... You know, Sheriff Joe and FBI and all those guys. They had to protect themselves. It's fascinating what you do when you begin to peel away all the tradition. And you begin to see. Mary, she had, look at Mark 6. 
just real quick. We got a few more minutes. You see, folks, Mary understood who she was. Mary, yes. No. She was at, at least 18, if not 19. Yes. She was childbearing age. So she is older than 14's tradition. She's not. She's a young maid. She's not an old lady. She's a young maid. And so she is in that 18, 19, 20 year range, right in there. Okay? Um, what did I tell you? Mark, Mark 6. Look at verse 3. Is not this the carpenter? Well, was jo- Joseph was a carpenter. The Lord grows up, he understands what it is to be a carpenter. The son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and of Judah and Simon. There are four brothers right there listed. And are not his sisters here with us? Sisters, plural, that's at least how many? Two. So there's six children listed of Mary right there. Now, what the new Bibles do is they change the brother of to say cousin. The problem is, is when you go back to Psalm 69, a verse that they haven't changed yet, you know what the Psalm 69 calls them? Brothers. <laughs> so she's not, she doesn't not have any more children. When you come back to Matthew 1, the women, the five ladies, Tamar, She's representing, again, Israel will find forgiveness in their Messiah. Rahab is demonstrating Israel will find acceptance in their Messiah. Ruth is demonstrating the issue of there's going to be deliverance in the Messiah. Bathsheba represents their security in the Messiah. And with Mary... So let's go, Israel, and let's be useful for the Messiah and for the program of what he's going to be doing. She knows right where she's at. She doesn't come with clouds of of grandeur. She just comes in and says, I'll be that low estate handmaiden. You and I have a similar verse for us. We'll close with it. Romans 12. It's not on your handout because I ran out of room. Romans 12. Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. Here's our verse. Here's what Mary was thinking, but for you and me. Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. There's Mary. Holy. There she is acceptable unto God. There she is, which is your reasonable, what? Service. Not unreasonable. Was it unreasonable for Mary to carry the Lord to birth? Not at all. It's reasonable. The Lord looks at Israel and says, come, let's reason together. God's a reasonable God. He's a gentleman. He'll let you have what you want when you want what you want. (laughs) But he'll also say, here's what I want you to do. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You see, folks, we're to have the same attitude that Mary did. We're to understand what's going on around us today in the age of grace. We need to understand what God's doing, forming the church, the body of Christ, what he would have us to do in that, and then go live our lives as who we are in him. Mary did. Next week, we'll find out about the ladies that saved the day. We'll talk about them, the daughters. Okay? Just don't miss Mary. I know that, again, out there in the religious circles, they promote her, they praise her, they worship her. Elizabeth does, and the instant that Elizabeth does there in Luke 1, you know where Mary takes her? That stuff we just went right through. She goes, yeah, I got it, but he's the issue, not I, but him. Okay? All right. Dearly Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the ability to look, to read, to study, to consider, to investigate, to enjoy. 
and to rejoice that you came, became made a man, and that you went and died for all of humanity. And you made that accessible to everyone. And we thank you for that. We thank you for your grace. In your name we pray. Amen.